Right, we've got uh, quite a few people on, so I'll uh, I'll just start by uh, introducing um, NX and our Security Week. Um, so the NX Security Week uh, basically was was an idea that as uh, we haven't had any um, kind of expos this year, right, due to everything that's been going on in the global climate, um, we wanted to try and recreate the kind of seminar or lecture sections um, within those exhibition exhibitions. Um, and kind of help with that transfer of knowledge from the industry leading experts um, to everybody else, whether you're an end user, system integrator, um, consultant, distributor. Um, we think we we really believe that kind of like sharing knowledge and, and making knowledge more accessible is, is important, especially with the amount of technology um, now within the security industry. So um, that's kind of why we did this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have We'll be putting all these videos on YouTube. Uh, so if you have missed any, or if you even want to use them as resources down the line, for employees, staffing, new people to the industry, um, these videos are going to be really beneficial, especially the, you know, what IP cameras are, how to choose the right IP camera, um, hardware, storage, and today, uh, all about the AI side of things. Um, so definitely worth uh, keeping an eye on when we put those YouTube videos up. Um, so, uh, NX Witness uh, or Network Optics, uh, our company, uh, the, the organizer of the event. Um, we are a IP video platform company. Um, we make IP video platforms uh, for AI, for security, for different verticals, um, with our flagship product being the NX Witness uh, VMS. Um, the, the platform was really kind of founded for three core principles. Um, you know, back in 2011, 12-ish, when platform was first being developed, there was a shift in technology within the security industry um, where previously it had kind of been very uh, kind of complex and cumbersome, these platforms, um, and kind of needed to be a professional IT um, person to really be able to use them uh, to their full capabilities. Um, and we kind of took that and changed it and went for a more kind of from the technology industry side and brought it more into security um, with professional UX designers. Uh, to really kind of simplify and make it a lot more kind of consumer available, but um, keeping and retaining all the advanced feature sets that you get from previous platforms. Um, so the first core principle of the platform was the usability of it, making sure that it's instantly usable. It's not complex. It's not hard to figure out. Um, you know, you can sit in front of the system and actually work your way through it without uh, kind of full training um, and just being able to actually interact with it, whether you're uh, completely new to computers and systems like VMS systems. Um, so that was really important to us. Um, our second core principle uh, is around the lightweightness and the speed of it. As I said, back in 2011, 12, when the platform was being built, there was a shift in technology where we were kind of saw uh, a lot of systems going from analog kind of four SIF D1 resolutions kind of, and then really hit that kind of 1080p, two megapixel resolutions to five to 4K and even 20 megapixels where we're at now. Um, so we saw that, that you needed an ability to really kind of transfer that data a lot easier, a lot better. So we have a lot of kind of technology on our system for adaptive, adaptive scaling to allow you to actually kind of stream video a lot faster, whether it's coming from the other side of the world or from the same room, um, instant access to that video without dropout lags, and things like that. Um, and then the third uh, core principle, which uh, kind of ties into to what we're discussing today with the AI side of things, um, is the extensibility of the system. So systems have become a lot more custom um, in terms of their requirements. The days of just like putting in a box and recording video has kind of gone out the window now, um, you know, with a lot of IoT devices, um, computer vision, AI, um, people want very customized solutions to fit their exact requirement. Um, and our platform with the open APIs, and REST-based APIs, uh, meta SDKs, and everything allow you to really uh, get quite flexible and custom how you deploy systems now. Um, so just kind of a different look on how uh, other systems previously versus how we kind of like see the market. Um, so on that note, uh, I will bring in uh, Dr. Rob Dupre from uh, VCA Technology. Um, really good talk this morning, so I'm actually excited to see it again. So Rob, do you want to take over and, uh, and start? Sure, yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, um, a big thank you to NX um, for providing the opportunity. Um, as, uh, as we said, my name is Dr. Rob Dupre. I'm the product manager um, here at VCA Technology. Uh, and I've got a little uh, uh, walkthrough in terms of what we think are really the evolution of video analytics. 
Um, and that really for us is to break down across um, the history of video analytics. So kind of an overview of how we got to where we are today. Um, a little bit of a demystification of, of that term AI and, and what we do with kind of computer vision. Um, give some examples of the algorithms that, that those uh, technologies provide. Um, and then hopefully give a little bit of insight on what we think the future holds um, around these sort of various uh, algorithms and, and architectures and, and technologies. So on that history, um, there's a little timeline just to kind of uh, spec out where and how we got to where we are. Um, a little look into you know why we analyze a video stream. What what are the outputs? What why do we spend all this time and money um, implementing these kinds of technologies? Um, and then a little overview of kind of two of the kind of benchmark or or milestone technologies that I think took us from um, you know just CCTV to the analytics act technologies that we have today. So on that um, CCTV, uh, or that, sorry, on that timeline, um, we start way back in the 50s where we've got, we started to see CCTV being used um, for kind of commercial monitoring applications. Um, and then 20 years later, we really hit a milestone in terms of um, those, those CCTV monitors being re recorded um, using VCR. Uh, and of course that, that's big just simply because the data that we're recording is then it can then be used as evidence and, and really it becomes a, a retrospective or history that we can we can go back to and use and, and that obviously frames a lot of what we do now in, in today's kind of analytics with regard to you know VMSs and storage. Um, in the 90s we see the introduction of multiplexing and, and that really just streamlined um, that recording it allowed the ability to have multiple camera streams um, on a single video uh, on a single um, display which obviously when you record that means you've got kind of built-in compression and it also meant from a monitoring perspective you could monitor many many more channels um, from a single person or, or without having to have a huge number of, of kind of visual monitors to do that. Um, in 1995, we see uh, one of the first IP cameras um, released by uh, Axis called the NetEye 200. Um, and that obviously signifies the, the, the first move from analog to, to digital. And, and that digital was really the, the point where we could start running, um, you know, running these, these uh, video streams through computers and, and analyze them for the kind of things that we want to do. Um, and 10 years later, we, we see that first camera with uh, analytics built in on board at the edge um, doing, you know, the kind of entry level, what we was considered the, the best analytics at the time. That was by a company called Intellio. Um, in 2007, uh, we first had our, our VCA technology um, analytics platform uh, on a camera uh, made by UDP. Um, and up until 2018, uh, we released something called our VCA core uh, analytics platform. And that was really the first time that we'd released um, analytics solutions that were powered by deep learning algorithms or, or AI. Um, and that VCA core platform is something that we obviously continue to develop. And, and actually, we had a, a very recent release of that a few weeks ago where we introduced some more DL algorithms and more features and functions. So why do we analyze a video freed? Um, many reasons, but I think when you break it down to the kind of core reason, it's, it's because something has happened and we want to know about it. Uh, and of course, we want to do that in an automated way. Um, we want to take away that kind of human monitoring aspect as much as we can, um, filter out a lot of that noise. So, you know, we are sending alerts or generating information that can be actioned um, and hopefully isn't wasting too much time and, and is, is kind of providing real value for, for the various application. There are kind of two sides to that in terms of um, we don't want those alerts to be generated uh, too generally. So let's say, for example, we generate an alert every time we detect movement. Um, you know, we're going to get false alarms from things like trees moving or illumination changes or, or maybe small animals, for example. Um, and obviously, every time we generate an alert, that, that alert needs to be validated by someone uh, typically and, and obviously either ignored or, or, or actioned as required. And then obviously the other side of that is uh, being too specific. So if we take this example we have on the right here, this is the, the old VCA technology car park. Um, and we've got a typical kind of uh, analytics uh, setup here in terms of a region of interest. We have a, a motion detected uh, or motion tracked person here. Um, and a typical rule set here might be, tell me when this moving object has been present in this zone um, and if it's a person, generate an alert. And of course that's, that's fine as long as we don't miss any component of that kind of rule graph. So if, for example, we don't detect this as a person, we may never get that notification. And so there is obviously that balance between missing things, of course, which would be could be a real problem, um, versus obviously having too many uh, spurious notifications that, that take up too much time. 
One other thing I think is important here when we talk about kind of the, the basic analytics uh, and really coming up to where we are now is that there was definitely an issue with kind of overselling the capabilities and the under delivering um, of those abilities, uh, you know, when, when analytics was first becoming prevalent. And obviously that I think really puts back or really put back the widespread adoption of these kinds of technologies. Um, because obviously if they are under delivering, you're, you're not going to spec out your next, your next installation, your next estate with, with the extra uh, cost of, of analytics if you're you know, generating too many notifications and you're missing things. I think we've, we've caught up to that now. I think the technologies for tracking and, and certainly with the advent of um, AI and DL, you know, those analytics are now applicable and, and generating real value. Um, and so we are starting to make good on those promises that were made a long time ago. And so, um, you know, I think analytics is in a really good place at the moment uh, for those reasons. So I mentioned there's sort of two technologies that I think really um, kick-started uh, that this kind of concept of, of video content analytics. And, and the first of those was motion detection. And motion detection is this idea that we can um, measure the amount of movement in a scene um, by the, the changes that we detect in pixels. So as a person or, or as some movement is detected in the scene, the pixels will change and, and we can measure that uh, and, and quantify it. Now, that's great, but the fundamental problem with that is there's no context. We've got no way of knowing whether or not this person that's moving around in our scene is a person or, or whether it's, you know, it could be background noise from things like the trees or, or shadows or any sorts of, or any combination of things. And, and if we're just generating alerts on that movement, um, we obviously end up in a situation where we could get too many. So motion detection evolved quite quickly into smart motion detection, um, and that was really making the algorithms a bit more robust, a bit more, um, a bit more intelligent to things like illumination changes or um, background noise um, or providing controls to sort of adjust that sensitivity based on, um, you know, on, based on the requirements for that particular camera view. The computational requirements to run a, a motion detection algorithm are pretty low, um, especially considering this technology was, was sort of created um, really at the, the early days of of video analytics. So in today's term, running this on the edge is, is, is trivial, really. Um, and this is an example of what it looks like. So this is our motion detection algorithm in, um, in VCA Core, and we use this to power our tracker. So we don't, we don't do just motion detection uh, on its own. Um, but you can see, obviously, with, a, with the sensitivity as high as it is here, you know, you're getting uh, the movement detected in, in sort of the reflections here on this kind of metal uh, cladding. We can see, obviously, the person is highlighted. Um, and you can obviously see the, the impact of the moving trees and um, depending on, on obviously how much wind there is. So the next stage of that, and really I think one of the biggest milestones around analytics was this concept of, of person and object tracking. And this is really taking our motion detection, drawing a bounding box around detected motion of interest, um, and most importantly, providing it with a, a persistent identification, uh, a particular persistent ID. And that pers persistent ID is vital because it tells us um, that the object that we're seeing in this scene is the same, uh, in this frame rather, is the same object that we're seeing in the previous. Um, and with that knowledge, that history of, of where the object has been, um, we can apply rules. And rules are really the, the foundation of being able to eliminate a lot of the noise that we would get um, from false alarms. We can, we can do quite complex behavior and detection. So we can do simple things like object entering a zone or an object has been in a zone for a certain period of time all the way up to things like tell me when this object has been in this zone and then has crossed into the other zone within a certain period of time and you know really define some very complex behaviors uh, which would eliminate a lot of the noise you would get from things like trees or small animals or, or things like that. One of the other nice things about this is, is with a calibrated camera we can also detect things like or estimate things like the size and the speed of the object um, and that in turn can be used for things like classification. So we can define this moving object as a person because we can estimate the, the height is around sort of two meters ish. Um, we know they're not moving at kind of 30 or 40 miles an hour. Um, and so we can, we can classify that as a person. And likewise, we can make the same estimation for larger objects that are moving quicker um, as vehicles, for example. And so we can do quite robust classification um, just using our tracker um, and a calibrated camera view um, without any you know, deep learning components at all. And actually we find that quite robust, um, especially for cameras, for example, at the edge where you, know, you may not have access to the kind of resources to do that. And again, that, this is uh, our tracker running inside core. We can see we've detected our person. 
Um, we still have our annotations on for the movement, but you can see as they went into this zone, the bounding box turned red, we generated our alert. Um, and we have another rule in place here that says, uh, tell me and uh, indicate another alert when the, the person is in for say seven seconds. And so we can see our, our dwell alert generated as well. So that really kind of brings up up to the point where we we talk about AI and and uh, and sort of the modern computer vision techniques um, that are being used today. And so um, I just want to talk a little bit about that term AI um, and give some uh, overview of what we call machine learning and deep learning, which are the, the typical technologies that people refer to when they say AI. Um, and then talk a little bit about the architecture of where these things might be run. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, it's a question that is asked uh, of me quite a lot. Um, and the answer is it's, it's quite contextual. Um, so th this is quite a good definition for today. Um, you know, it's a development of a computer system which is able to uh, perform a task that would normally require human intelligence, uh, such as visual perception. So things like our tracking tasks or recognizing whether this moving object is a, a person or a vehicle, for example, speech recognition. So the kind of technology that's used in your um, smart, uh, smart uh, device at home or your phone, um, and then obviously decision making and translation. So those, those really represent today um, difficult challenges uh, that we're trying to solve with, with computers and, and, and learned models. But if you take that back, say 10, 15 years, um, our motion detection also is a computer system that was able to perform a task that would normally require a human intelligence. So we would normally have a person monitoring a, a video feed. Um, and if somebody was moving or doing something of interest, we would we would have that person generate that alert. And obviously, when motion detection and, and tracking first came out, that would also really have been confirmed as a, a sort of an artificial intelligence. So when we say AI, it really does mean everything to everyone. Um, you know, people again, sort of over promise and, and say that the analytics can kind of do anything um, because it's not that specific. Uh, and so there is a risk of history repeating itself a little bit there. Um, and which is why it's great to have these kinds of opportunities because we can go in and, uh, and talk about, you know, how the algorithms work and, and where they work well and where they don't work, you know, because as with any analytics, um, there are places where it does and doesn't. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's very similar to where we were back with the original analytics, but um, you know it's an exciting time in terms of what is being done. So a little bit more on um, on what really drives AI. Uh, and as I said, when people say AI, they typically mean um, some sort of machine learning algorithm, um, and that can either be a deep learning algorithm or, or what I would call sort of a traditional machine learning algorithm, which really for us represents anything that's not a not deep learning. Um, and so I wanna give a little bit of an overview of what the difference is and uh, how you go about training something like that and, and what, what's really changed um, and, and why it's changed. So this is a sort of traditional machine learning pipeline in so much as we have our input uh, and our task may be, for example, to identify whether this is a person uh, or not. And so as an input, we have obviously our image and our bounding box. Um, and what would be traditionally done is we would try and describe this object to the computer um, in a way that highlights a particular property of that object that we think would best represent a person. So it might be things like shape, it might be color, it might be texture, um, but it's a, there's a human in the loop component here to designing uh, this sort of description of, of this object that we can then pass to our machine learning algorithm to learn the difference. So, once we've developed our descriptor, we take lots of samples of people, we, we describe them with our feature descriptor, uh, and we pass them to our algorithm, and then we take lots of examples of not people, um, or whatever our other class is. Again, we describe them with our feature descriptor, and we, we try and get the machine learning algorithm to define some sort of boundary, some way of dividing uh, feature descriptors that represent our people and feature descriptors that don't. And so once we've learned that model, um, we pass in a new feature descriptor that represents our new object, uh, and hopefully we get an output like this that says we think it's a person. Um, now the advantage of something like this is uh, lower data requirements. You know, this was built at a time where we didn't really have access to huge, huge, huge data sets. So um, by its nature, it doesn't it doesn't require quite as much data to train. Um, and that's why we still see some use of this technology today, because in situations where you know data may not be accessible, um, this is still quite a good way of of kind of um, making use of smaller data sets. 
<clears throat> now, when we move on to deep learning, um, the fundamental difference here is that we, we no longer define what we think the computer should be looking for. There is no human in the loop component to say, oh, we think you should be looking for shape or color or, or texture. We basically give enough samples to the computer uh, for it to make its own assessment of what, what pattern, what, what component, what property of the image it's looking for um, to make the best decision about whether or not this is a person or, or some other class that we're looking for. Now, disadvantage of that is that you typically require much more data. Um, we give millions of samples of people or millions of samples of vehicles, um, and eventually the model is sort of pushed into the best way of, of separating those various classes. Um, and the advantage, of course, is it's much, much more accurate. Um, the computer is able to pick up those patterns in a way that we, we weren't able to define. The other big advantage is we get something called a, a confidence fact for, uh, value at the end of it. So this is a, a representation maybe of a model that might have three outputs. Um, and this is what we use in core. So our first output may be whether or not it's a person. Our second output may be if it's a vehicle. Um, and the third may be, say, background. And so one of the nice things is we get a probabilistic representation to say, OK, this object that we've our input, we think it's 83% a person, we might think it's 10% a vehicle, uh, and we might think it's, say, 7% background. And that threshold allows us to provide another kind of filter to say, actually, if we don't, if the model's not that confident, if we think it's, say, less than 70% a person, maybe I don't send that alert. Maybe I keep uh, analyzing and keep checking that, that object until we get some kind of classification uh, that would be above our particular threshold. So um, one of the best ways of illustrating, I think, the progress that was made um, as a result of this kind of deep learning approach uh, is something called the ImageNet 2012 challenge. And this challenge is basically to take um, a, a number of images and to classify each one of those images into one of a thousand different classes. So that, that those classes range between different kinds of vehicles, it could be different kinds of animals, it could be all kinds of things, um, but you've got a range of objects and we need to figure out which object, uh, which class it belongs to. So back in 2011, um, we see this kind of sift and feature vector approach. So this is what we would define as our kind of traditional machine learning approach. Um, and we're still getting 50%, which is you know, pretty impressive given that we're talking about a thousand different classes um, each one of these objects could belong to. Um, but we see quite soon after that in 2013, um, really the first kind of commercially successful deep learning based convolutional neural network called AlexNet. Um, and we instantly, instantly see a jump from 50% up to, to 65. And that really kind of opened the floodgates a little bit there. Uh, and we see lots and lots of um, models and other methods that were put together. Um, and obviously that, that accuracy increased over time. And, and we're starting to see that slow down a little bit now. And um, these gray dots represent other methods, whatever they may be. And, and we've got obviously the state of the art, uh, so the best performing models at the top here. Uh, and you can see that cur curve is obviously um, decreasing slightly. Um, and, and that really comes for a couple of reasons. I think the first being that um, at some point you're going to hit hit a place where there isn't that much more accuracy to gain. So, for example, if a human was doing the task, actually, how accurate would a human being be? A human being be, um, and it may well be that we're actually ahead of them already. Uh, you know, maybe that a human can only get 80, 85 percent. So, there is a point, obviously, where we get diminishing returns on on an investment on research, um, as well as, of course, you know, that there is only so much accuracy to gain from the current technologies, and, and maybe it won't be until we see, you know, a fundamental shift before we see, um, you know, some, some massive gain again. So why now? Why do we see that, that big increase? Why was 2013 the, the point of, of uh, inflection there for this kind of this technology? And really, it comes down to two things. Um, one is the rise of big data. So it, it wasn't until around this time um, we started to have uh, access to data sets, including millions of images. You know, so up until this point, we had these sort of data sets of tens of thousands of things. Um, and without that big data, without those millions and millions of samples, um, deep learning isn't able to make those classifications, and those distinctions properly. And so the rise of big data was one aspect of that. And then, of course, the ability to process that with things like parallel computing devices like GPUs um, at an affordable level um, meant that we were able to then combine you know, the computing power and the data to, to train these models. And in fact, the actual concept of deep learning, the algorithm that pushes and learns those distinctions is, is very old. It's, it was based, I think, in the 70s. 
um, but it just wasn't viable at the time because there wasn't enough um, compute power to, to make it work. And so, um, you know, those things aligned and, and, and we are to where we are today. So a little bit on architecture. Um, th this, of course, is quite a big subject in terms of, of how you want to configure uh, an AI enabled analytics system. Um, you sort of, I think the utopian dream, of course, is to have some edge devices uh, like you know AI enabled cameras, for example, that can process the video um, and then and then do something with that. Maybe send that information up to the cloud. Um, I think at this stage there's limitations there in terms of things like bandwidth and and of course the actual camera platforms themselves, which are, uh, are are getting there but are not quite there yet in terms of what we can do. And um, more typically, what we see is is kind of a, a, a dumb camera at the edge with with some sort of server based uh, processing device. Um, on site, and that might be doing your storage as well, for example. Um, and this will typically be where you do your GPU based processing. Um, now, one of the things I'm asked quite a lot is about GPU at the edge versus GPU in the cloud. Um, and, and cloud processing has a major advantage in that it's on demand. So if I'm only doing my security based analytics from you know, 6 p.m. through to 6 a.m., I only need that hardware sort of 12 hours a day. And so um, to buy servers and maintain servers, uh, basically 24 7 seems quite expensive but actually at the moment there's not a huge difference in price there and um, you know certainly when we were setting up our architecture at the at vca um we still buy dedicated hardware just because the cloud bill would be too expensive and so that will of course come down um but i think certainly for the foreseeable future and, and for the next couple of years i think we'll still continue to see um, this kind of implementation uh, until those kind of bandwidth and, and data security and, and various other um, constraints are, are eased slightly. So of course, let's let's give some examples of algorithms um, that are commonly used. Uh, and, and for us, there's sort of three main ones, the first being um, detection and classification. And so this is the idea that I can pass to a, uh, a deep learning model, my, my image frame, my uh, frame of video, uh, and it will come back and tell me where the objects of interest are, and of course, what they are. And we've got this percentage confidence score again that we can see here. Um, and these are great, you know, we, we can get nice mature off the shelf models um, that detect a large number of classes. So not just car, it could be bus, truck, uh, but, you know, all kinds of sort of vehicle types, um, as well, of course, people and things like that. And, and those are readily available. Um, there's lots of frameworks to support them. Um, you know, so, so a solution can be put together very quickly. For security and for um, kind of general analytics, there are a few components that are missing there a little bit. So number one, we have no concept of whether or not um, this person is the same person we saw in the previous frames. So there's no tracking there um, to say, uh, you know, that we have that kind of consistent ID that we can then apply our rules to. Um, and obviously rules become such a major part of analytics and um, that it's, it's, it's vital really for it to, to function. Um, and of course, there's no concept of whether or not this is a, a, an object that I actually want to know about. So, if this, there's no way of detecting whether or not this car is moving versus another car that might be. And so, um, you know, there needs to be some something else there to kind of add the context to really make it applicable. With this kind of algorithm, um, we run it every frame. We have to run it every frame, otherwise we don't know what's in the in the frame. So there is a GPU overhead there, um, but that's typical with, with these kinds of algorithms. Now, pose estimation is, is a similar kind of concept. So this is basically a detection and localization algorithm that is focused entirely on people, um, but it has the added benefit of, of defining um, key points of, of that person. And these are typically um, joint locations. So it could be left and right knee, left and right hip, for example. Uh, and obviously if we, we can then map those together to project, provide a kind of a, a skeletal representation of a particular person. Now, again, this is run per frame. Um, there is a relatively high GPU cost on this, but again, they're coming down as the models um, improve. Uh, as well as the models being quite robust, you know, they are able to handle quite complex scenes. You know, if we wanted to do motion detection on these kind of scenes, we wouldn't stand a chance. And so um, these kind of models are great because they are they can handle things like occlusion. Um, you know, they can handle very complex range and distance, uh, and so are very good for this task of of detecting um, whatever they're looking for. Now, of course, we have the same problems. They're static objects. We've got no way of knowing if they're moving or not. Uh, or, of course, if it's the same object between frames. And so on top of that, we need to build something on to, to kind of unify all of those um, components. And so at VCA, we've done that. We've developed something called the Deep Learning People Tracker. 
um, and that takes a, a pose rest estimation model um, and applies our tracking technologies uh, and gives us kind of the best of both worlds. And the reason we've done that is really for uh, this exact example. So this is a, a, a typical camera view um, for installed for a security application in, in a retail store. Um, and it's obviously installed to monitor people going in and out um, via this entrance. Uh, and if we wanted to use that camera to do analytics, if we wanted to use motion, we just, we don't stand a chance. This is motion analytics um, annotated on here. Uh, and we, we couldn't get really anything useful out of that. And actually, if we wanted to do analytics on this, we would typically have to have maybe another camera mounted, um, probably vertically. We would do maybe line counting. Uh, and of course, there's no, there's no crossover there. There's no way I can use that vertically mounted camera to do security. And I can't use this camera to do analytics. Whereas with the application of uh, the deep learning people tracker and, and DL algorithms, we are then able to utilize um, the same camera view uh, to provide, um, you know, a, a, uh, an input and a source for our, um, for our analytics. And, and in this case, we use them for things like retail, uh, for business intelligence. And so we get nice clean tracks now. There's no, um, no impact from the noise of the movement. We're getting this additional data about um, you know, the, the orientation of these people. So we can do things like slip, trip and fall detection. Um, we could localize the face, for example. Um, so we get these kind of added advantages uh, that you wouldn't get with just something like motion detection or even with just a straight detection and classification algorithm as well. So the last one um, is object classification. And we sort of touched on this in terms of the example uh, of, of ML versus DL. So I have my region of interest. I have my bounding box um, and, a, and an object classification model will tell me what is in that, that region of interest, what is in that um, location. And the disadvantage of that is you need to have something that, that tells us where that bounding box is. I could pass it the whole image um, but I would only ever get one classification. It may be vehicle, it may be background, it could be, could be anything. Um, so we need to sort of segment that and say, okay, actually, I only want to know about this region. Um, and of course, we have our motion-based tracker, which is, a great, which is great for that. We can tell, uh, obviously, only moving images. We get that bounding box based on that movement, uh, and then we can apply a deep learning model to, to tell us what's in that, that region of interest. And this is, this is great because it's lightweight and because the, the, the object classification model is very lightweight. Um, but more importantly, we only need to run it when we need to. Uh, and that could be when we see any motion. It could be when uh, a particular moving object generates uh, an alert or, or triggers a certain set of rules. So we can really be quite, um, quite efficient in terms of sharing resources like a GPU uh, over many, many channels. And so, for example, we would spec out, say, a 32 channel uh, analytics uh, server with, say, a, a GTX 1660. Um, and for things like perimeter detection um, for sterile zone uh, protection, you know, that, that GPU will cover the kinds of activations we see there with, with no problem at all. So what does that look like um, in, in core? So here is a, an example. We've got our region of interest. We're back in this um, side view of the building. Uh, and I've got a couple of rules set up here. So I've got my region of interest and I've got a dwell rule. So when an object, a uh, moving object is detected in this region for three seconds, I will then pass that bounding box over to my deep learning filter. And if my deep learning filter says it is a person or a vehicle uh, with a certain confidence score, then I can trigger an alert based on that. So what we'll see here is we'll, we're actually going to pick up a, a little fox. We can see we've, we've detected the movement. Uh, and after a few seconds, we classify that. Uh, and in our model, anything that's not a personal vehicle would be classed as background. Uh, and obviously we don't generate an alert on it. Um, and the other nice thing here is that we can continue to evaluate this, this object. We can see that confidence score changing as we keep checking, just in case we're missing anything, um, we can keep going back and, and making sure that that's not something of interest that we're, we're gonna miss. So on, on to the future. Um, so hold my hands up first and just say that I'm, I'm not a, uh, an analyst in this industry. You know, I, I can only talk from um, the experiences of our uh, sales team, which have, which have got years and years of, of, of experience within this industry. And of course, um, as a product manager, I'm liaising with our third party integrators and, and customers um, on their requirements and on their projects. And uh, so this is sort of an insight based on what we've seen as, as kind of trends um, and the requests that we see uh, over the last, certainly over the last two years. So the first of those is really about um, the application of DL. You know, so being able to um, use these algorithms uh, in more places has been a, a, a bit of a game changer. So we, we've, I gave you the example of the, the deep learning people tracker. 
being able to reuse a camera that we would never have been able to use before. Um, so we have this ability to kind of value add um, into existing uh, infrastructure, which was not possible before. Um, and of course, we increase the accuracy. So even on cameras that we may be not using at all versus ones that we were, those ones are now producing better quality data. Um, it's more reliable. You know, it's, it's, it's generally just more accurate. We're also finding that the algorithms that drive this, this metadata, these generation of the events, um, are applicable to many different scenarios. So we, as VCA, tend to operate in a number of verticals that could be things like security and uh, business intelligence and, and that's typically retail um, and things like traffic monitoring and ultimately they are all tracking tasks they all want to know where the object is whether it's done a particular behavior um, and of course what it is is it a person is it a vehicle is it is it something else uh, and the other big side of this is, is of course the metadata so we as a, a analytic platform generate alerts you know the person is in your zone here is an alert um, and, and that was obviously a major driver uh, to, to action that event. Something needs to happen at this time. But what we're starting to see now is that the metadata, the, the data that we are, are always generating to be able to trigger that alert um, is now actually the, the real value. So no longer is it just about tell me when the thing happens. It, it's now a case of being able to go back and, and filter and forensically search through that, that kind of metadata to, to uh, pull more value. So it could be from a traffic perspective, tell me about uh, all the number of vehicles that, that turned left at this junction, or maybe I want to know of all the people that were wearing red that were seen on cameras four, five, and seven uh, between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And so that can be great for security to filter down uh, video footage. It can be great for um, business intelligence in terms of insights and, and you know, maybe establishing where the busy and non-busy periods are. Um, but ultimately, they are all the same algorithms. And so uh, it, it's a combination of good metadata and, and, uh, and algorithms that work across our platform. So we spoke a little bit on architecture already. Uh, and so, again, this kind of utopian dream of having uh, kind of smart cameras at the edge that are connected to a cloud system that does all of your processing and storage and, and maybe all your management as well. Um, I think it's, we, we're getting there on that. As I said, we still have these concerns about bandwidth. Um, and maybe things like 5G will address that. Um, I think that remains to be seen and it's certainly not, it's not coming in the next year or two. Um, and of course, there is still this question of security. Certainly we encounter a lot of our customers that have air gap networks. They don't have the connection to a, a you know, a proper cloud service. Um, you know, it's all tends to be an internal VPN or, or some sort of um, internal network. So there are obviously always limitations around that. But what we are seeing is there are more and more cameras being deployed with AI DL based hardware. So a lot of the algorithms that we've been speaking about today are now possible at the edge. And so our deep learning people tracker, for example, will be on a camera um, in, in fairly short order. Uh, and of course, the cameras themselves are becoming much more functional as a as a platform. They are able to handle uh, many more applications and, and there are app platforms themselves that are springing up around that. So you could buy a camera for a particular task and then repurpose it in maybe six months when the when the purpose of that, that uh, analytics has changed, for example. Now, when we do get to that point where you can install a bunch of cameras, connect them to the network, and make sure they're registered with your cloud and walk away. And that obviously then gives us much more access to things like the SaaS models, so software as a service for things like your VMS and um, for your processing. So we can do you know, on-demand processing. We can limit things that we don't need to, uh, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, we can make sure it's optimal uh, and change that relatively easily. So that will certainly come more and more into play. Uh, and I think we'll start to see this kind of architecture much, much more, um, you know, in, in relatively short order. So one thing I did want to talk about was, was data security and, and specifically GDPR. Um, and that really is because deep learning generally is a, is a data driven uh, process. So if I have, if I want to train a model uh, like we have at VCA to do things like CCTV based uh, analysis of people and vehicles, I can't train that algorithm on, you know, pictures from uh, TV or, or soap operas or, or films um, because it just won't apply to the CCTV view, which is kind of washed out and grainy in a slightly different field of view. And so when we when we talk about deep learning, it's very much a rubbish in, rubbish out. My, my input data, my training data needs to represent my, uh, my output, my, needs to represent where this model is going to be deployed. And so for things like data, 
um, and security and, and the various places that we tend to operate. Um, obviously, GDPR and, and you know, the, the rightful uh, recent approaches to data privacy make collection of that data very challenging. And so um, certainly in the future, we will need to find new ways of, of training those algorithms, new sources of that data. Um, and there are a number of options already. So I spoke about public media and, and the pros and cons of that. Um, but we have CGI. Anyone who's watched a, a Marvel movie will know what is possible in terms of you know, photorealistic representations of things. Um, and there are also neural networks, deep neural networks, um, the generative adversarial networks that can generate photorealistic um, data. And so we can almost have deep learning networks training deep learning networks. Um, so there are there are options. And, and there is another technology called uh, transfer learning, which is the ability to take a model that's trained to do one thing that's trained on a specific data set. So again, we might train it on public media. Uh, and then we might fine tune that network on a much smaller data set of, of very specific data. So it could be, for example, um, our CCTV footage, we may have tens of thousands of images, for example, uh, as opposed to millions. And so there are ways around it, for sure. Now, lastly, um, you know, what, what actually do we think we're going to see uh, in the future in terms of algorithms? And it, it's a difficult one. Um, Certainly the actual problem that we're trying to solve in terms of the presence of an object in a particular location and the alerts that we want to generate around that hasn't really changed. You know, it's we still want to know whether or not the person is there or is it a person, is it a vehicle? Um, and, that, and that's the same all the way back from, you know, to the 50s when we first started seeing CCTV. Um, what we obviously are seeing is, is algorithms becoming lighter and faster and more accurate. Um, and, you know, I think we've we've certainly seen that massive influx of, of accuracy. And, and I think there will be that slowdown that we spoke about in relation to that ImageNet task. And I think we'll see that in the industry a bit. Um, there is this term AI winter, which is this idea that we've kind of hit the kind of local maxima of, of what is possible with the current deep learning approaches. Um, and that maxima is, is generally attributed to things like the, the ever increasing data requirements and, and the problems that we've just spoken about in terms of acquiring it. Um, as well as the fact that even if we had millions and millions and billions of samples, um, the compute power required to train that and the time uh, is just too massive. And so I think until we see a, a fundamental uh, redevelopment of the algorithm, um, we won't see a major change in, in things like how accurate and, and, and the approach to solve the problem. I think what we will see um, is things like deep reasoning. So this is this concept where at the moment I can obviously tell you whether the object in your car park is a person or a vehicle, but I can't really do anything more than that. Um, you know, I can't say whether or not that's that's John from accounts uh, and he's coming back because he's left his keys. Uh, whereas a security guard may be able to do that. He may have been on his rounds. He may have seen the keys on the desk. He can recognize John from the CCTV. He might be able to unlock the doors for him automatically, you know, enable the lifts, do all that kind of stuff. Um, which a deep learning model just can't do. It's got no common sense, no ability to plan or predict um, you know, what the needs of, of a particular system will be. And, and so I think we'll start to see systems that are able to do that, to apply data from different sources um, that are certainly working at a more generic high level. Um, so that's certainly one side of things. Um, I think the other big advance we'll see is the use of unsupervised uh, learning. And this is the concept where at the moment, if I want to train a model to do a, a particular, let's go back to our, our classification task, I need to label that data. I need to know that my 100,000 pictures of a person are people. And I need to know that my 100,000 pictures of vehicles are vehicles. Um, and so there is a, an overhead, a cost to labeling that data. And so unsupervised learning basically uh, at, a, at a low level just divides all of our data, if we don't label it, um, into a, a number of classes whatever those classes might be. Um, and then we can go in afterwards and say, okay, well, you all of these squares that you've put together, those are all people. All of these triangles that you've identified, well, they're vehicles, and then everything else is background. And we can, we can then use large amounts of data that would unprocessed, unlabeled data um, to train our models in a much more efficient way. And maybe that will be the input to training another model, or it may be just um, that we use that already trained model to, to analyze our next object. So just to sort of summarize, um, obviously deep learning has really progressed analytics and, and deep learning AI is that term, um, has obviously really expanded on, on what we can do and, and how accurately we can do it. 
Um, and although we the, those requirements are coming down for running those algorithms, there is still uh, there's still a requirement to have sensible approaches to do that. So one of the reasons the deep learning filter is the way that it is is because it's very practical to run that and at a state at a relatively cheap cost. We spoke a little bit about data access and, and the impact um, of GDPR and, and getting hold of that data. And I think that will slow uh, development of, of the kind of algorithms that we're seeing at the moment. Um, and really that kind of innovation will shift to not what we train, but how we train it. Um, and so I think we will see kind of new approaches to labeling data on mass and, um, and maybe that uh, data creation in terms of CGI and, and, uh, and photorealistic data generation. Um, and then lastly, I think kind of two of my most important points in, in regards to this is that those analytics requirements aren't, are certainly slow to change. And again, I don't think they've changed a great deal over the last few years. Um, and of course, for us, certainly metadata is the future. You know, there's the, the algorithms that we now run produce really high quality metadata. Um, and that is what we're seeing is the major requirement um, and the major use cases for, uh, for projects and, and certainly our third party innovators. So metadata is, is the future. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening and uh, very happy to take questions or, or uh, any questions just get in contact. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, again, really good presentation. I actually picked up on some stuff that I missed the first time. So um, if anyone wants to ask questions or, uh, or has any questions to ask, feel free to use uh, the chat or the, the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, if you can't see it, if you hover over your screen, you'll see them pop up. Um, we already have a couple coming in. Um, so uh, what sort of questions should an integrator end user ask themselves when deciding which analytics provider to use? Are there any gotcha questions, indicators about the tech you'd recommend to qualify a vendor's solution as solid versus question? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, this obviously covers a, a large number of things. And I think really, ultimately, it comes down to the requirements of the project. Um, you know, th there are lots of approaches to solve very similar pro problems. So I've spoken about the fact that, you know, ultimately we're trying to detect or classify or do some, some task that I think we've all, all been doing for a long time. Um, and so really when it comes to, if the requirement is there to apply an AI algorithm, often it's, it's really a down, down to um, accuracy. You know, if I want the most accurate solution, I can probably have that and I might get four or five channels on a, on a big beefy server and it might cost thousands of dollars a channel um, to be able to analyze that. And actually, if I just cut that, that requirement in terms of false alarms or, or that accuracy from 99.9 you know, .9 down to say 95 or 90%, it may be I get to a point where I can have hundreds of channels running on that same server. And so as with most things, I think it probably comes down to cost. Um, but yeah, it, it's really about what the expectation is of the system. Uh, and this again also slightly ties back into that, that term AI. And so people say, oh, it's AI, it's gonna be super accurate. And in, and in lots of cases, it's definitely better, um, but it's never gonna be 100%. And so, you know, in some respects, it's about balancing the, the expectations of the user as well as the requirements of the project. Yeah, for sure. I think um, always making sure that stuff's not overpromised. Um, mm. It's key. There's a lot of people at the moment AI sector that uh, say a lot of uh, what can be done rather than what's actually possible right at the second. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, definitely need to look out for like actual examples of uh, the AI um, rather than just based on verbal um, kind of confirmation of what can be done. I think it's important. Yeah. So, certainly one thing that we spend quite a lot of time doing in regards to um, when someone comes to us and says, will your analytics do this? We, the first thing we ask to ask for is video footage. So if, if we, when someone comes to us and say, we're trying to solve this problem, and um, the best thing you can do is go, here is a video of, of something happening and I want you to show me what your algorithm can do on it. Um, and that, that is a great way of assessing whether or not their a particular vendor's analytics is going to do what you want it to do. It's not always pragmatic, access to the data can be challenging, but um, if you really wanna know how good someone's analytics are, just tell them to annotate a video um, of their problem. And, and that's a pretty good indicator. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool, we have a couple of uh, questions Oscar's just shot over that were asked this morning as well, um, just for everyone that's on this, this call to hear them. Um, so what is the most commonly requested uh, analytic um, in the security market based on obviously your experience at VCA? Um, what's, yeah, what's the most commonly um, requested AI that people are looking for? 
Sure. So, so um, about 70% of VTO's business is, on, is in security. Um, and typically security for us is around uh, property protection. So perimeter protection, sterile zone, uh, monitoring, things like that. Uh, and so for us, one of the things that we're requested for a lot is, is just reducing those false alarms. If in a situation where I've got movement detection, so I might have tracking, or I might even just have motion detection, um, I, I want to kind of reduce those false alarms and reduce my overheads for things like the RVMs and, and the monitoring of that site. And so uh, I spoke about this kind of problem about air gap networks and not necessarily having ac access to particular cloud services. And so for us, we needed to find a solution that kind of did on-site edge validation or verification. Um, and so that's really what the deep learning filter was about. It was a, uh, a request to say, look, I need to reduce my false alarms. I'm, I don't have you know, the ability to send this stuff to a cloud and come back down again. Uh, and I don't want to spend thousands of pounds on a server. And so we needed to find a lightweight solution um, that would allow us to reduce those false alarms, verify whether or not a particular thing is a person or a vehicle or a thing of interest. Um, and so certainly that those were the kind of two big requirements that uh, we are very often asked to solve. Yeah, for sure. Um, and another one uh, we've got coming in. Uh, so this was a question from this morning as well. Um, so regarding the AI data collected um, for the deep learning, who owns the data? So the AI company and the end user, right? So like, um, are AI companies harvesting data from deployed sites effectively? Yeah, I mean, obviously I can't speak for other companies, but um, VCA specifically doesn't. Uh, we are, we've actually just gone through fairly heavy, um, uh, a rethink of, of GDPR and, and, you know, checked all our processes in regards to the, the new legislation. And, and for us, uh, we don't store anything. Uh, so you can obviously send uh, alerts and metadata and information from a VCA system or, or a camera, for example, to your VMS and store that. And that's absolutely fine. But we don't ever see that data. We don't see any information, any statistics, any usage of that of that data at all. Um, it would be great if we could. It would mean we have access to more and more data to train our models. But actually, when you start considering the issues around consent and making sure that that data collected is is in a proper is in a, an official and proper way um it all becomes very spicy and so in some respects it's fear we just don't get involved because um you know we have other uh, ways of accessing data we have partner companies that we work with uh, who come to us and, and ask us to solve a problem and provide data that's correctly uh, obtained with that um but yeah I, i'm there are definitely ai companies that do uh, and, and it will be in your terms and conditions and, and certainly should be um, well documented because it is you know there's hefty fines involved so you've got to make sure you are on the right side of the law yeah for sure especially in, in um, the eu right with gdpr oh, legislation yeah. um so probably you know, obviously if it's a standalone system the chances of them harvesting data is going to be quite slim because it's it's on it's on your own um, kind of on-prem um if it's a cloud-based solution then it's something you should probably just double check or look into something that's uh, of concern um, so another question here, this is probably more from my side. So are all VCA analytics integrated with NX Witness VMS so that objects and paths are shown on top of video in NX Witness and users can create rules slash search video based on metadata generated by VCA? Uh, so we had this question this morning as well. Um, so yeah, the, the meta plugin, um, I believe is either out now or is coming out shortly. Um, we've been working with VCA for a long time, so we've always had HTTP events and notifications from all the alerts from the VCA system. Um, but either, like I said, coming out soon or come out already, uh, we now have a full um, integration with our Meta SDK, and that allows you to actually have the boundary boxes, have all the region of interest as well, so you can change all the region of interest depending on where you want the zones to be that you're detecting uh, movement or tracking uh, people or vehicles. Uh, Rob, I think you said you're not 100% sure if it's out yet either. That's correct. Yeah, it's not, it's not actually my product to, to manage, but um, yes, there's been lots of work on it. So I think it's, it is imminent, if not out now. Yeah, yeah, we have a, 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 an OEM in common, so uh, I believe uh, it should be pushed out very soon. So uh, yeah, that, that, that will be coming out soon. If anyone wants any more details or any questions on it, uh, feel free to reach out to myself. Um, or any of your NX sales reps, whoever's your main point of contact, or if you don't have one, uh, you can call sales at nextoptics.com um, or reach out to Rob, whose uh, information's on the screen, and sure. we can sure we'll get you your demos and stuff set up. Absolutely. Um, question in the chat as well from Tony Luce. Is this a new NX data center? It is our new uh, NX data center. Um, 
it's it's also got some really good sound dampening on it so uh, it's really quiet running data center that i've got um it just looks better than my bedroom wall uh so uh there was a couple of questions one i wanted to reiterate from earlier um which was machine vision right because you touch on obviously the, um, the deep learning and machine learning and what the difference are between them and then obviously machine vision and computer vision is thrown around a lot especially obviously in our industry um, so if you just want to answer that same question just for anyone that's on this one yeah i mean as you say these are all kind of terms that are thrown around a lot and, and actually often they're all meaning the same thing so machine vision computer vision is really the concept of applying some learned model or some some AI concept in inverted commas um, on on video or, or imagery uh, as opposed to something else. So, you know, a machine vision algorithm uh, wouldn't be able to take as an input, for example, speech or or some other kind of modality of data. Uh, and typically, that that applies to um, only video or, or imagery to start with. Uh, but ultimately, it's it's kind of like a hierarchy. So, really, deep learning is is a particular type of algorithm, um, and it is actually a type of machine learning uh, or a machine vision learning algorithm if it's applied with data uh, and, and machine learning and deep learning all kind of comes under this umbrella of, of AI uh, and so yeah we, we try and avoid AI just because it's it's a bit ambiguous um, but yeah computer vision machine learning uh, sorry computer vision and uh, machine vision all relate to video or, or imagery um, machine learning is a kind of umbrella uh, term for any model that's learned uh, some some task so differentiating between x or y or whatever it would be um, and deep learning is one technique uh, that that comes under the umbrella of machine learning um, but really is what people talk about when they say ai yeah no, that makes sense um so then we had uh the question you you obviously brought up deep reasoning towards the end there it's kind of like the, the, one of the trends where people are going because obviously the classification side is kind of hitting its its peak uh, mm. so then it's more like what can you do with classifications right yeah. um so kind of similar to a question that was asked earlier um so when we start doing these kind of um ai systems is it going to be the classification sound with deep learning and then the business logic will be tying everything together or if, are we going to be able to start programming that complexity into an actual ai engine that starts on its own realizing um oh bob's left his keys he's driven back in so let's open the door now bob yeah. yeah i mean it, it's it's a difficult one um cer certainly at the moment there is quite a clear divide on that and so you have you have particular deep learning models or, or machine learning models that perform a task so detection of your people uh, or, or you know classification or whatever it would be um, and it might then be that you train a another model to uh, amalgamate all that information and maybe take as inputs your kind of decisions and other inputs from various other data sources uh, and then combine them in a particular way. Uh, it, it's all about training a system with a particular output. So you have to be able to, for a system like this to say, well, if, if it's this, this, and this, this is what I want you to do. And obviously in, in kind of a traditional machine vision task, you know, we showed a picture of a person, we tell the system that you should be thinking this is a person. Uh, and if we do that enough times with enough samples, then that's the hope is that the next time it sees a person, it says person. And that would be the same with the decision support system. You would want it to be able to um, take as a bunch of inputs, uh, you know, your various different systems, whatever they might be, uh, and then produce an output that, that is useful to you. And so we might get to the stage where you just have a, a kind of mass system that's monitoring all your cameras and, and kind of doing everything in one go. Um, I think that's very far down the line. Um, so I think at the moment it will be a business logic system where you have two separate models doing two separate things, um, each quite clearly defined. Yeah, cool. So that's where there's the whole concept of like having a an AI pipeline system where it's like yeah. going through the different kind of models that they end up with. Uh, kind of similar question actually came in from, from Tony as well. Um, so currently AI is great at identifying objects. When should we expect it to um, to be good at identifying behaviors and yeah, I mean, there's lots of research into it. It's um, something I looked into a little bit uh, a few years ago in terms of being able to uh, detect a particular kind of behavior, like, for example, fighting or, um, you know, someone lying down or, or, you know, there's lots of kind of behavior detection algorithms that are out there. Um, and, and, you know, some of them do see the light of day. Uh, typically, they don't necessarily work with, um, with RGB or, or kind of infrared cameras. They tend to be using... Uh, two and a half D data. So maybe time of flight cameras, 
um, or, or sort of LIDAR sensors. So we've got not just the image, but some sort of concept of depth as well, um, just simply because it, it typically you don't get enough information from just the video um, you know we need to, the computer needs something else to ascertain you know whether or not that person is moving in a particular way uh, and what that movement is over time so um, th those those technologies are around they're certainly around in academia and I think we you will start to see them come into play relatively soon actually certainly I've been on talks and presentations where people have have pitched them at us um, I, I just personally don't think the reliability is there yet to see them actually deployed in, in a real life solution. Um, but again, it, you know, th those industries move fast. And I think in the same way as we saw that, that classification uh, hike from kind of 2013 upwards, I think you're going to see the same thing there. There'll be a, a big, big influx in, in accuracy and development. Uh, and again, you'll then start to see it to slow down. So I, I don't think it'd be long. I think we're talking years, um, but, but not tens of years, put it that way. Yeah, I think that will be a big advancement as well, right? Like uh, that kind of is the first step to that deep reasoning kind of stuff that we were uh, we talked about in the previous question. Sure. Um, yeah. So definitely uh, looking forward to kind of that next step. Um, last question uh, that I have um, was, so you mentioned obviously that this is this is all based on an algorithm that was developed in the 70s, right? Mm. Um, so if we didn't have the data sets and the, the computing power in the 70s, kind of what was the the kind of the algorithm was it just a conceptual thing a bit like when leonardo da vinci invented the helicopter or was it um yeah. actually like implemented in some way yeah i mean it's so um yeah so when it comes to academia there's, there's kind of two approaches when you want to publish a paper one is that you can do it from kind of an engineering standpoint and say i've developed a thing this is how good it is and how, how accurate it is on this data set and, and you sort of proof it that way um the other option is that you math mathematically prove that given a particular set of data or numbers or, or inputs, um, I can prove that mathematically it's going to provide this output at the end. Um, and so the deep learning algorithm, or the concept of a neural network and training a network to change um, over a certain number of iterations uh, was just basically proven as a concept way back when. Um, and I think for a particular set of tasks, you know, very basic tasks at the time, um, you know, you could run it and you could do it. But I mean, the idea of being able to process an image or a video just wasn't possible um, back then, I, I, partly because, you know, we, we didn't even have an IP camera at the time. So, um, yeah, so it, it's sort of a, a culmination, I think, of things and, and, you know, people going back and applying uh, old technology to new problems um, is also quite a common theme when you come to academia and um, you know it's not necessarily all about coming up with a new idea it might just be an idea of combining two things like you you said there in terms of having a model that does one thing and then applying business logic that's you know equally a good way of solving a problem rather than trying to reinvent the wheel so to speak cool um all right if anyone uh, if anyone else has any questions please feel free to ask away um this uh, webinar or presentation will be available uh, on our YouTube. So if you found it helpful or thought it was a, a really good presentation, please feel free to share it with anyone you want to. Um, it's available, uh, it should be available next week, I assume. Um, so uh, definitely uh, worth sharing to people that might be interested. It's a great, great overview of where AI is and how it works. Um, also, we have our last day of the NX Security Week tomorrow um it's kind of our wrap up day i'll be doing the presentation with our team um and we'll be uh, kind of going over how to design a modern IP surveillance system so we'll be taking basically bits of all of the, the presentations over the last four days um, in terms of cameras hardware um, storage and ai and uh, how you kind of put that based on your customers requirements into a system that not only meets and exceeds expectations, but also it's future proof systems, especially like for instance, what we're talking about today, uh, there's still a lot of growth to happen within um, AI, maybe not in terms of the uh, positivity of the, the classifications, but in terms of like, uh, anal analysis of behavior and, and the deep reasoning side. So you can make sure that uh, systems are future proof where they can actually adapt to, to the technology ripped out, started again effectively. Uh, so yeah, feel free to jump onto that one. As I said, these are available to anyone. It doesn't have to be specifically a customer of ours or any of our partners. If you're an end user, consultant, uh, just someone interested in the industry, feel free to, to jump onto it. Um, so on that note, thank you everyone for joining today. Thanks Rob for the, um, for the presentations today. Uh, really good, I thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, and I'll hand it back to you for your uh, closing statements. 
Yeah, thanks, James. And, and again, big thank you to to NX for providing the platform. It's it's always nice to be asked to do these kinds of things, and and um, yeah, it's always a great opportunity. And and yeah, if there were any other questions or any um, any clarifications that people wanted, then the details are there. And and uh, please do feel free to get in contact. Great. All right. Uh, goodbye to everyone for now, and uh, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Sounds good. Thank you.